Father, we ask you in the brief time that we have together that we would, Lord, exalt your word above anything and everything. Thank you that you've given us light and a lamp unto our feet. Thank you that we have, Lord, your instructions, your very word, your very mind for the things that we deal with. And Lord, in this, uh, this passage that we'll read, although it may be treacherous to, to read how incredible it is to think that you would allow your son to be treated this way, Lord, we have to stand back and, 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 and shut our mouth and say, Lord, you know ultimately what it took to redeem us. And that is your very son to be treated in such a cruel and in such a painful way and betrayal and desertion. Lord, that it, it epitomizes who we are, uh, just the people that are fickle, people that uh, can, can say hallelujah one day and, and walk away the next. And Lord, we ask you that you give us courage and strength as we read this passage of how the disciples failed, Lord, and I'm sure we would have failed in those situations and how they ran and how they were scared and how they, they did not stick to the end, Lord. Father, we ask you that you give us strength to endure till the end, in our end, in our day and age. Lord, that these are dark days. Those are the days that Jesus faced as well. But Lord, he told us after he raised, he would go before us into Galilee. Lord, after you come back, they would be right. Things will be made perfect and things will be right in this, in this world and in this age. So Lord, help us to look ahead and help us to think and ponder the, the enormity, Lord, of what it took to save us. What you gave up, Lord, to become like one of us in sinful flesh, and yet without sin, you took on our sin and gave yourself for us. And we ask you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 22, and it's a long chapter, but we're right at verse 39. After Jesus was, uh, he took uh, the disciples up to the upper room and, and such an amazing, if you go to the first slide, such an amazing turn of events. In fact, if you were to read this in chronological order and, uh, and, and through the gospel accounts, you would have to read Mark chapter 14, John chapter 18, and uh, Matthew chapter 26 to really get the flavor of all the things that were happening. In fact, uh, when you read it, in a synoptic account, meaning taking all the Gospels together and putting them in a timeline, you will find out something very interesting, is more things happened to Jesus during this week. This is all one week, by the way. It's, 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 it's elongated because so many things happened. But more things happened to Jesus during this week, and more prophecy was fulfilled during this week than his previous 33-some uh, years that he lived on the earth. Uh, this is what you would call the uh, the, the vector effect. All things happen as we got closer to the cross. Things began to multiply and prophecy began to be fulfilled faster than any other time in the ministry of Jesus. Even before he came to Bethlehem, even before he started the ministry, things happen sporadically, things happen along the way. But when you get to the last week, it just speeds up to an enormous amount of prophecy being fulfilled. In fact, most of the book of John, I don't know if you know this, most of the book of John is the last week of Jesus. Most of the book of John, the whole gospel of John, is the last week of Jesus from chapter 14 and on. It's his last week. And so when you read all the things that happened to Jesus, most of it happened during this time. So uh, we are on holy ground, by the way. This is, this is an amazing thing that are happening to the Lord so fast, so quickly. And within the last day, even more things began to happen because he took, uh, he took the disciples up to the upper room after the anointing of Bethany, uh, at Bethany. Uh, he took the Passover meal at the upper room, uh, which, by the way, it was most likely John Mark's house. We'll, we'll explain that as we get to the end. John Mark, uh, the accompany, uh, he accompanied Paul on one of his mission trips, the writer of the, of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, Jesus sets up the meal there. He actually sets it all up in the upper room. And he has the meal. He has the Last Supper with them. Well, we would say the Last Supper was a Seder, di uh, Seder dinner. And he begins to question the disciples. He begins to say, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And they're all, is it I, is it I, is it I? And they all were in trouble. They all felt like they were in trouble. And uh, Jesus told them he was going to be handed over to, for, for crucifixion. And uh, somebody was going to betray him. And he would not drink of the cup until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. 
He predicted that all will desert him, and he predicted that Peter would deny him, all within that span of time. And let's read verse 39. So this is where we get to that point. They come out of the upper room. Verse 39, he came out and he proceeded, as it was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. Now, the book of Mark tells us, as well as Matthew, that they sang a hymn when they went out. So I'm kind of filling in some of the gaps. And um, what a beautiful story, if you think about it. They sang a hymn. Jesus, knowing full well what was going on, still has the heart to worship God and the heart to sing a song. I don't know what you do when you're stressed and, and, and at travail of your soul, uh, but worshiping God is one of the best things you can do. And I don't know, you might not feel like it, but our Lord did it. They came out and sing a song, a hymn. Most likely would have been one of the Psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, uh, the Hallel Psalms, the, the Hallelujah Psalms, one of them. We don't know which one. We're not privy to them, but they still sing them to this day and during Passover. In verse 40, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you, not may, that you may not enter into temptation. By the way, there's a very, very important command. This is written in a command form. We're to pray, not a suggestion, but it's a command to pray that you may not enter into temptation. When did temptations happen? You say all the time, right? You know, when did temptations happen? It's, it's difficult times, right? It's talking about trials. It's talking about difficulties. It's talking about times where you're pressed. It's time you pray. It's time you sing. <laughs> These are the things that God is telling us from a, from just by reading it, the Lord's telling us certain, certain things about trials and difficulties. This, this is the trial of Jesus. This is the hardship of Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 12 tells us that he ran the race. He ran his own race. So we're to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? We're looking unto him, how he did it. How did Jesus handle his most difficult time in his life? How did he do it? Well, he's an emblem. He's a, a model for us to emulate, for us to know how to handle difficult times. Look how Jesus handled his. The way Jesus handled his is the way we handle our most difficult time. The hour of darkness, Jesus went on to say. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down, and he began to pray, saying, Father, if, this is your, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down onto the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise up. And pray that you may not enter into temptation again. Chris, can I get a water, brother? Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you, brother. So let's, let's understand this part. In the book of John, just turn there real quick, chapter 18, we're told something very interesting about this passage. John chapter 18 tells us that this place called Gethsemane was a garden. It says in verse 1 of John 18, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth in his, with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, and there was a garden in which he himself entered with his disciples. Now Judas was also there who was betraying him. He knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. If you go to the next slide, please. We're told that it was a garden. It was a garden by the Kidron Valley over the ravine, and the Kidron Valley... You see a picture there? It's not a very good picture. It looks like a cloudy day. Uh, but the Kidron Valley, it actually, uh, it, it's a very interesting thing because it goes right through and it divides the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. You have um, the Temple Mount on the right side, Mount of Olives on the left side, and the Kidron Valley runs right through that, and Jesus would have gone over that Kidron Valley. And literally, you can see it today. It, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, the Temple Mount is on the west, the Mount of Olives is on the east, and you can go through it, even to this day, and you'll end up in this place, if you go to the next slide, uh, where they many consider that the Garden of Gethsemane. It's actually probably, it's very much, thank you, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, this is a place where they actually took the, the olives that were used for the temple service. They took the, the, the olives from the Mount of Olives and they took them there and they were pressed. They were crushed. And they took the oil and they made the oil to go into the temple for the menorahs to light up the, 
to, to light up the, the, the whole entire um, temple. You could actually see it from a distance. It was brilliant. It was radiant. And the, the, the lamps were called the light of the world. It was like a light unto the whole world. It was the light of God, which, of course, is what Jesus said about himself. So it's interesting that the very one, Jesus, the anointed one, the anointed one of the Spirit, goes to the place where they crush the olives. It was a place of his crushing. And there's about a two-hour gap. It's about a two-hour gap. If you go back to Luke, it's about a two-hour gap in between when Judas comes and he goes to Luke 22, and he goes to and arranges it with the high priest and the soldiers. He arranges it all, and Jesus has about two hours to be with his disciples, and in a brief time, he has to pray. He has to pray. It says here, he came out. It was his custom, verse 40. When he arrived, he told them to pray. Uh, in fact, I want to take you to one more place. Go to Mark 14. Mark chapter 14. I want to take you there very quickly because he gives us a little more details. More details about what was going on at the time of this prayer. In verse 32, Mark 14, 32. 32. I know I'm a little jumpy today on the passages, but it's good for your fingers to get accustomed to flipping your Bible. I love when people turn their Bibles. You know what happens when you start doing this? All your problems start going away, right? Your marriages get right. Your life gets right when... You page, you turn your page, you're looking for God's word, you're getting into it, right? It's, uh, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful sound. I love that sound. And they came to a place named Gethsemane. Uh, and he said to his disciples, sit here well until I prayed. And he took with them Peter, James, and John, and he began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond that, and he fell to the ground, and he began to pray and asking if it were possible that very hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father. Uh, literally, he would have used the word Abba, Abba, crying out to God. It was a, a term that only little boys use, right, for their daddy. It was, it was a beautiful picture of the relationship between him and his father. All things are possible for, the, for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not I, what I will but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and keep praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleepy, sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and he said to him, are you still sleeping and, take, and taking your rest? It is enough. The, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinner, uh, sinners. Arise, let us uh, be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And Luke, it says, an angel came and strengthened him. He prayed three times. And it's interesting, he tells some of the disciples to stay here at the entrance of the garden. Then he takes Peter, James, and John, and he says, you stay here. And then he goes on beyond them, and he begins to pray. It's sort of he set up this, this three-stop uh, situation. He had three stops before uh, the, the, the betrayers would come. And why did he do that? It's because he needed time to pray. It's like a watch. He had a couple of watchmen coming out and looking out for those who were coming to betray him. He had the disciples at the beginning, Peter, James, and John in a second spot, and then he went beyond that. Uh, you see that Jesus is setting up... A, like a perimeter, <laughs> a perimeter for prayer, a perimeter in terms of, look, I need time to pray. You watch with me. Watch for those who are coming, but you pray. You be in prayer. And if you've ever been part of a prayer, uh, all-night prayer vigil, the flesh is really weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you guys, have you been to a, like an all-night prayer meeting? Um, by 2 a.m., you think, I cannot do this anymore. You want to, you really do, but depending on your day, it's a long day, you've had a long day, really tired, and you just can't go on anymore. And Jesus came to them. Three times he asked them to pray, 
to pray and to pray. Why? It was the most difficult hour of his life, the most difficult time of his life, and he called to prayer. So we need prayer in the most difficult time. And it's not just only on difficult times, but when those difficult times come, we're to pray. All this, when you're reading this, the, 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 the hour of Jesus' dark, the dark time of Jesus' life and ministry, it correlates to the end times. It always correlates to the end times. Peter, in his letter, uses this passage uh, about praying. And you could tell by a man who failed in prayer at the most difficult time. He says, be watchful, be prayerful, right? Be praying. One, the devil's like a roaring lion. He might devour some of you. Yeah. He knew quite well, didn't he? And he goes in, the last days are here. So what kind of a person are you to be in all manner of faithfulness, perseverance, always praying, Fervent in prayer. He uses the word fervent in prayer, meaning that you're to constantly, passionately pray. And he always relates it to a time of persecution, a time of difficulties. What was Jesus' time? It was a time of persecution, a time of difficulties. And we're to pray and we're to watch. Keep watching, keep praying, keep seeking. This is a very important time, uh, important lesson for us in the last days. We're the believers of the last days to see how Jesus endured his tribulation. He endured it through prayer. He endured it with his disciples. He just needed a time to pray. And we were to seek times for prayer. Did you know that? Uh, I mean, I know some people feel like, well, prayer just has to be spontaneous. It has to be so spiritual. Um, that's not really true. It can be spontaneous and stuff like that. But you could actually set it up. <laughs> you can set up a prayer time. You can, you know, lock the kids up in a room or, uh, or get away for an hour or drive for an hour. It doesn't matter. You set it up and you pray. That's what the Lord said. You set it up and you pray, and you see Jesus, how he just needed time. I know two hours are up. He knew the betrayer was coming. And remember, he only had a few times, uh, a, a, few, a few hours at max to do his. One thing that's really interesting is this idea of the cup passing from him. Many people have said, well, did, was Jesus fearing his death? Was he, was he really struggling about death? Did he really was thinking about it again? Was he, was he going to go through with this? And it's not necessarily that he's fearing death. Uh, a lot of other people have faced death more courageous than, than Jesus if he was fearing death. But he's talking about the cup, the cup. This idea of the cup keeps coming up. In fact, if you trace it through the entire Bible, you will find 20 times the, the metaphor of a cup about something, it, it's a metaphor for what people have to go through. So a cup in the Old and New Testament, it's like a, a metaphor for something really hard, really difficult for that person to go through. And 17 out of those 20 times, it's about the cup of indignation of God, the cup of wrath, the cup of God's anger towards sin. Uh, in the book of Genesis, it talks about the cup. Psalms talks about the cup, the cup of wrath. And it's this cup that Jesus is referring to about enduring it. He is enduring something that no one else would endure, and that is the cup of God's wrath towards sin. No one else has done this at this point. No one else has endured the wrath of God uh, against sin. Even to this day, no one has fully taken the brunt of that God's wrath against sin except Jesus. And the experience of being cut off from the Father. Remember this wonderful relationship between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This, this unique relationship of the triunity of God that nobody has ever been able to interrupt. Always been there. Even when Jesus came to Bethlehem, he always had a direct link to God, to the, to the Father. Always, always, always was in touch with the Father. And that unique relationship that no one else has. We don't have it, even as sons of even as sons of God through Jesus Christ, we don't have that, that nearness, that closeness, that, in, that uh, perfect relationship with God. Um, he was without sin. He always communed with God. He always talked to God, even as a, a man on the earth. And for a moment, it will be temporarily interrupted. And Jesus dreaded it. Jesus dreaded that interruption that was coming. He dreaded the cup that was coming against him. He dreaded this cup that would be the fury of God and his anger towards sin, toward my sin and your sin, and it was going to be poured out upon him. And it began to happen at the garden. At the cross, Jesus received the full brunt. It was poured out on him completely. But it begins in the garden. That's what you see him sweating drops of blood that's why this is his hour of 
travail, the, the agony of his soul. Uh, the, the, the book of, uh, I think it's Matthew, talks about that he was uh, um, to the point of uh, he couldn't stand it. It was beyond death. But it wasn't death he was afraid of. He was, a, uh, he was concerned of the interruption of the relationship with the Father, taking on the sin of the world, and that he being separated and becoming sin for us, and he couldn't endure it. And he asked the Lord, let this, let this cup pass from me. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Father, I don't, I'm going to stop praying that. I'm going to do what you want me to do. If you want me to take this cup, I will take this cup. And it's a beautiful picture of the Son of God, obedience until, de until death, complete obedience. You know, God always wanted, what God has always wanted was a man who would obey him 100%. That's, God, that's what God's always wanted. That's what he always wanted from us, from mankind. It's one person, one man to fully trust him to fully love him, to fully submit and obey him completely. In the book of Psalm, it says, I have come to do your will, O Lord. It says that in the volume of this book, it is written of me. It's a prophecy about Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus. It's quoted again in the book of Hebrews. This prophecy about Jesus is that he would become a man and that he would be fulfilling what God has always wanted. You desire obedience. You did not desire the, 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 the offerings of bulls and rams and goats, but you desire obedience. You desire full commitment. And that's what Jesus was, was, was being here in this picture of Jesus, the obedient Son of God, until death, that no matter what happened, God's will was priority and above everything else. What a lesson for us, isn't it? When we face the difficult times and difficult trials of our lives, is God's will and glory what you really, really want? Or is it just an escape? Or is it just to bail out as fast as you can because it hurts too much? And you go, what kind of masochistic God do we have? He's not masochistic. He wants obedience. He wants obedient sons. That's what he wants. And he's always wanted that. From the beginning, it was Adam, but he couldn't. Right away in the garden, fell. Why? It was his will. Not God's will be done, right? <laughs> it was basically saying, God, it's what I want is more important than what you want. And so much has that passed on to us, isn't it? So much has that become our trump card for our daily living. Not what God wants, but what I want, what I feel I should have and what I feel I should want. It's more important than anything else. And we've never experienced being cut off from God. We never experienced the wrath of God. We never experienced any of that. Jesus is going through that. And even through the dreadfulness of receiving the brunt of punishment of sin for what he didn't do, he says, Father, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. He prayed, he asked God, God, is there any other way? Can man be saved any other way than for me taking the wrath of sin? And God never answered that prayer. God never answered that prayer with a yes. Yes, there's another way. This is why Christianity, it's, it's unlike anything you've never understood before. It's not a religion. It's not anything man-made. It's completely God-made. It's completely a message from heaven. It's completely a message from God that it is what God wants, ultimately, is his son to be obedient until death. And therefore, God became, becomes the, most, uh, the, 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 the prototype for all of us, the obedient son and, and for us to understand that this cup was the only way for Jesus, the only way for us to be saved. That's why we as Christians are absolutely 100% in the right and the truthfulness to say there is no other way of salvation besides Jesus. God did not give us another way. God did not say, oh yeah, there's Buddha and, and Confucius, whatever culture it is, whatever whatever new age thinking there is at the time, just go with that, and that's going to be for you. He said, no. Father, is there any other way? No. Father, is there another way? Maybe men can be good. Maybe they can work their way up and be, and be sincere. What about if they're sincere? No. No. 
What if they get in touch with the heavenlies and, and do spiritual things? No. Nope. It's only, when, only one way to become spiritual, and that is through Jesus Christ. Right. In fact, if there's another person, if there's another way, if people try to become spiritual through any other means, the Bible calls that a familiar spirit. The Bible actually calls that, that is an abomination to God. You can't get spiritual besides from Jesus. You can't have contact with the spiritual world unless through Jesus Christ. Any other means, any other way, it's an abomination to God. It's a familiar spirit, and it's condemned by the Bible. Uh, that's why the only way to the Father, the only way to any spirituality is to Jesus. That's what this idea of being spiritual but not a Christian that roams around in our day and age, you know, the spirit of the age, you can be spiritual. Oh, I'm not a Christian, I'm just spiritual. I heard that so many times. You hear it, I'm sick of it, to hearing it. I'm spiritual but I'm not a Christian. I'm spiritual but I don't read the Bible. I'm spiritual but I don't follow Christ. Then... You're not following Christ. <laughs> You're following what the Bible says. Uh, it's witchcraft. What they call it witchcraft. The Bible calls it familiar spirit. Another way, another way to heaven. But anyway, let's continue. One question that it it's comes from this is, all the disciples were sleeping. Who wrote all this down? Is that a question? Good question. If all the disciples were sleeping, how did that happen? How did they know that Jesus, you know, sweats for blood and he cried out and three times he came? And we'll have an answer in a minute. But let's go to the next slide. Just a question to puzzle you. See, you came to church, you have to think. Yeah, I, know, I know it's like a really bizarre idea to think in church, but that's really what you have to think. You have to think. You have to read the Bible and you have to think, ask questions. The Bible's not afraid of questions. The Bible loves to answer questions. Now, the story of two gardens, uh, I, this is the title of our message. So if you understand salvation history, salvation history, you see this picture of redemption, right? You see creation, you see redemption, you see glorification, when God makes all things uh, to come to an end, the reconciliation of all things, and everything will be brought under the feet of Jesus. For his, he will be the king. But in redemption, in salvation history, you have this unique picture of two gardens. Something happens in two gardens that tells us a story of redemption. In Genesis chapter 2, if you want to turn there very quickly, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, we're told something about a garden that God created from the beginning. And from the beginning, God wanted something for mankind. God wanted man to be in perfect fellowship, in perfect love and harmony with him, and in Genesis 2, 8, we're told this. And the Lord planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and he placed, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. In chapter 3, verse 8, after sin entered the world, after sin, uh, mankind did his own thing and violated God's plan and command and went after Satan's plan and command. It says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. This garden of Eden becomes the fall of mankind. It becomes the fall of mankind because man could not keep God's commands. We're told that God was walking in the garden. We're told that Satan was there in the garden. In fact, we if you just read chapter 3, the serpent, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, which was the devil was more crafted than any, any other beast on the field, and the Lord God made. And he went to the woman, and he says, had God said, questioning God's word, and this is a whole other study that we can get into about questioning the word of God, but that's what Satan ultimately does for us to fall, is to question God's word. And we see that mankind is there, God's there walking in the cool of the garden, you see Satan there, and, in, and later on in chapter 3, we're told an angel comes, and he drives out Adam and Eve out of the garden. Well, we have another story of a garden. Remember, John tells us this was a garden. Gethsemane was a garden. And you see the story here where the olive, olive oil is pressed, where the olives are pressed to produce the oil. You see God, Jesus in the garden. You see a serpent, Judas, right? Judas was possessed by the devil. He ent the devil entered him. You see an angel. You see betrayal. The angels comforted Jesus during this time. You see uh, betrayal, temptation, but you don't see sin and disobedience. What you find is that Jesus becomes the second Adam. Jesus becomes the second Adam in that he reverses what Adam did. 
Adam could have said, not your will, but my will be done. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. It's the reversal. He reverses everything. And Jesus becomes the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15. Go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul picks up this idea and he explains it in such a unique way in the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 21 and 22. Speaking of Jesus and the resurrection, for it says, For since a, by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, all of us died in Adam, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Look at verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-given spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. And he's talking about the, 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 that Jesus becomes the second Adam. The first Adam sinned, and all of us sin in Adam, by the way. You understand that? All of us have sinned in Adam. We'll all come from Adam. We'll all have that sin nature that comes through Adam by being a human. Uh, the psalmist said, Psalm 51, in sin my mother conceived me. He, you know, some people mis misunderstand that scripture. It's not saying that uh, David was conceived in sin. Somehow his mom was doing something terrible. Uh, but he was talking about that in sin he was... In the womb, he had already had a sin nature. It was already, he himself knew uh, in, 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 his, in the womb, he already had a sin nature in him. In Adam, all sin. In Christ, all will be made alive. You can make a point of this. There's really two people. There's only two people that God recognizes. Adam and Jesus. The two people that came through supernatural means. All of us came from mom and a dad, right? All of us came right from mom and dad. And Adam didn't. Adam was created. And Jesus in Bethlehem entered the world by the Holy Spirit and, put, and, and was put in, in Mary's womb. Jesus and Adam are the only people God recognizes. For humanity, all are represented in Adam or all are represented in Jesus. That's it. There's no third. And so humanity has to make a choice. Are you in Adam or are you in Jesus? That's all it counts. The first Adam, all of you have been condemned by him because of him, because of sin, and that passed on to us, that we do exactly what Adam did. We disobey God. We live a sinful life. All of us have died in Adam. Sin leads to death. But in Christ Jesus, all are made alive. All are given life. All are given spiritual life. All will be resurrected because of Christ in Jesus. There's only two people. And so that's what's happening in the garden. That's what there's a story of two gardens, a beautiful story of two gardens. Which garden would you rather be? Well, I like Gethsemane. I know what happened in Eden, but I see what happened in Gethsemane. The redemption story. By the way, isn't it interesting that mankind always tries to go back to a utopia? You ever seen that? Yeah. Whatever, it was either Mao trying to become, you know, making China the communist you know, place of the world, and, and it was going to be a utopia for them, or, or Stalin in Russia, or places all over, Napoleon tried to do. Everybody tries to do a utopia. Everybody wants to go back. Why? In, in, innate in us, inside of us, of humanity, there's a this thing that we've lost. And we've always tried to go back to that. That's what we always try to seek a getaway. We're always trying to go to a beautiful place or we're always trying to go back, isn't that? Like we're always trying to get away from something and, and go there and maybe for a week we might just feel really good. And then we go back to work, right? Or then we go back to our, oh man, what happened? We're always trying to escape, isn't it? Every one of us knows that there's something better. Even the, even the non-believer knows there's got to be something better than this. That's what they always try to go to the most beautiful places. What? Innate in us. Innate in us. It, it, naturally, we look for something that we've lost. Something that we've lost. We've lost Eden. And we're not coming back to Eden, by the way. That's why it is so... Um, it, it is impossible. It will never happen. Utopia on earth. 
will never happen unless you go through Gethsemane. Unless you go through the garden where Jesus bled drops of blood and cried out that the cup would pass from him, unless you go through that garden, you will never find true peace in a beautiful place. I know men try to find it, try to get it, and it won't happen. Why? They're trying to go back to Eden, but you can't go back to Eden. It's done. There's an angel that says, drive him out. You can never come back here. But now, when Jesus resurrects, in the book of John, it tells us that the tomb was a garden, wasn't it? And what did the angel say to Mary and to the disciples? Come, come on in. Why? They need to see that the redemption has been completed. Jesus has risen from the dead. You can go back to the garden, but not Eden. Gethsemane, the resurrection, the tomb. That's what you come back to. That's where mankind is hopes, and it's not in coming back to a utopia. There won't be a utopia without God. The millennium will happen, but it's because of Jesus. And all those in Christ will be there. You see that? All those, so the world seeking this, the harmony with humanity, everybody holding hands and everybody getting right, and in the harmony, you know, of the, of the, you know, the syncretism of the harmony of the universe, and everybody look at their navel, and everybody just pray really hard, and it won't happen. Because you can't go back to Eden. But you can go to Gethsemane tonight. You can go to Gethsemane tonight. Let's go back to Luke and let's, let's finish this off before, I, um, before lunch starts and people begin to want cake and ice cream. Verse 47. Luke 22, I'm sorry. I keep saying 23. I think I want to get there. 47. Luke 22, 47. And while he was still speaking, a multitude came and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them and he approached Jesus to kiss him. And he said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? If you go to the next slide, please. Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around them saw that he was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And a certain one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and the elders who had come against him, have you come out with swords and clubs as against the robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. You see that? This is the power of darkness. The power of darkness of Jesus' life mirrors the power of darkness of the last days. Right before Jesus comes, this is a picture of the last days. What happens? There's betrayal. Jesus said, we'll betray one another. There's, there'll be darkness. There'll be the power of Satan. There'll be those. There'll be a man who Satan will enter him a second time, wasn't it? It's called the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come in the last days. It'll be basically Satan incarnated, just like Judas. And there will be a betrayal and a persecution of God's people. But what did Jesus say? Have you come out with the kiss? You know, this is an affection. This is something... Judas, his heart is so callous, so hardened, that he used something that was of an affection to someone and used it to betray his Lord, his master, Jesus. And Peter, of course, grabbed the sword. Remember, they were just talking about a sword earlier, and he grabbed the sword and he cuts off his ear, and Jesus said, stop it, no more of this. We're told in John that the guy's name was Malchus. He was a temple servant of the high priest, and Jesus healed his ear. You know, it's amazing to me how much Jesus was in control of the situation. As crazy as the events were topsy-turvy and everything is going around and drops of blood, prayer, angels, Satan, the devil coming in, clubs, swords, somebody taking an ear off of that, Jesus is like, stop! Heals the guy's ears, and we'll see it in John in a moment, and he actually begins to call the shots. He's actually giving himself away. And you can't imagine, how can you imagine the Son of God giving himself away to darkness like that? How can this happen? Well, it's how much God loves us and how much it took to redeem us. This is the power of darkness. This darkness is coming. It's prevailing. It would seem to me today that darkness seems to be winning more than the light. It seems to me that it's getting stronger and righteousness is growing weaker. 
And you would look at the time of Jesus and you would say, oh man, righteousness, Jesus, why are you giving yourself away? It's all happening so fast. Jesus, why are you doing? Why do you let this happen? And so he grabs, Peter grabs things with his own hands, right? <laughs> and he tries to take away that, the weaknesses of Jesus. Now, this can't happen to our Lord and I'm going to fight for him. And Jesus said, stop it. This, is, this has to go this way. And this is why it's so important to remember that God gave Jesus over to him, gave himself over to the authorities. God gave his son over to be killed. Um, we're told in the book of Daniel that authority will be given into the hands of the Antichrist for, for 42 months. For a brief time, this world will be under the power of the devil, power of Satan. It's already under the power of the devil, but it'll be a complete given over to the power of Satan. Can you imagine that? If all the atrocities of life had happened, the Holocaust, the Inquisition, and things that have happened throughout the world, that was with the restraining power of God. What's going to happen when God gives time and authority into the hands of this man? This is why the gospel needs to be preached, because people need to escape from the wrath to come. This is why we can't sit idle in church and just pretend like, well, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But you can, the Bible says in Peter, that we can expedite the return of Jesus. We can make it happen sooner by discipleship, by preaching the gospel, by making people aware of that Jesus is coming. It's a fixed time, don't get me wrong. It's going to happen when God says, but you can, on our time, on our side of eternity, we can actually make it happen sooner by preaching the gospel and getting the church ready for Jesus to come. It's really interesting how that works. I'll explain that in another time, another study. Um, but Jesus foretold us this was going to happen. And Mark, it says, all of the disciples left. They all fled. They saw the thing going on, and they all fled, and they all left. And back to the question. Back to the question. Who was present when all the disciples were asleep? How do, they, how do we know the story? If all of them were asleep, how did we know that this actually happened? Well, in the book of Mark, we have this little epilogue. Go there real, real quick. Mark 14. I'm sorry. I won't keep you any further. Uh, keep you any longer. Maybe I will. Um, some people are going, yeah, keep going. And some people are like, it's a joke. A certain man, Mark 14, 51, a certain young man was following him and uh, by the way, in verse 50, they all left him. And a certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they grabbed him and they seized him, but he left the linen sheet behind him and escaped naked. And it's the only place in the Bible that you'll find a story. Now, what does it have to do with the... It's almost like, what is it throwing in there for? Who really... How did this happen? Well... We're, no, we're not told who it was, but we can put two and two together. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, it's, um, he wasn't a disciple, by the way, but he was very much part of the New Testament story. His, um, his mom, his mom in the, in the book of Acts, was a very important part of the early church, and she would hold Bible studies at her home. Uh, and John Mark accompanied, travel, uh, accompanied traveling Paul in his first missionary journey. And Mark is the writer of this gospel where the story takes place. This is the only time it happened. And the upper room, the Seder dinner that they had, was in John Mark's home. So how did this happen? I believe this man is John Mark. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind who he was. He was asleep when the Seder dinner was going on, and he heard the disciples going out after the Seder, and he followed. And he followed very closely and he was an eyewitness of everything that happened to Jesus at the time. He was hiding. That's why when the, when the, when the troops came, when, the, ar or when the, the army of the temple came, he saw everybody fleeing, and he tried to take off, and a, a guard spotted him, and he grabbed the sheet, and he ran off naked. And he never forgot that story, where he had to get back into his house naked and try to figure out how to get back into his, his bedroom. But this was a story that was emblematic of, of Mark. This story, he watched everything. He was there, sort of like Mark is telling us here. By the way, I was there. I was there. And in fact, I want to finish off with this. He was there, but we were all there. Turn to John chapter 18. 
And let's finish off with this. We were all there. Mark was there, but he was in the background. We were there, not in the background necessarily, but in the lives of the disciples who we emulate. We try to be like the disciples. We try to be like them. We have an apostolic faith. We, they're emblematic of us. In John chapter 18, Jesus is going through this betrayal. Look at verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus the Nazarene. And they said to him, I am he. Literally, you would see it in your Bible. The word he is in italics. Whenever you see that in your Bible, that is a manuscript addition to clarify something. There's not an addition in the Bible. Don't start freaking out about it. Uh, it's basically the translator trying to help you understand what he's trying to say. I am he. I wish they would have left those off. Um, you know, sometimes I get into this rant about, I, I, I wish they would have done this to the trans. I'm not a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar at all whatsoever, but I study these things, and I wish sometimes they wouldn't do those things because it more confused people than anything else. Literally, he would have said, ego emi, Greek, ego emi, I am. It's the, the, the idea of the tetragrammaton of, of God speaking to Moses as the great I am. He is the I am, speaking from the burning bush. He would have said those things. He said that in John 8, by the way, and they almost stoned him. Jesus said the same thing before Abraham was, I am, ego emi, right? They would have stoned him for that. He is proclaiming deity with God. He is the burning bush voice, the voice from the burning bush. And they drew back and they fell to the ground. I love that story because in the Greek it actually says that they fell back and then they slid forward. Really eerie. They fell back with the power of God and then they slid forward. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Even in his betrayal, even in his complete destructive hour of darkness, he's still the Lord. He's still in charge. Who are you looking for? I am. Jesus of Nazareth, I am. Boom, they all fall back. And then they slide forward. You know the whole thing about slain in the spirit? People think that falling back is a great thing. No, it's a judgment from God when you go like back like that. Everybody that has an encounter with God, they all fall forward, right? Daniel, John, they all fall forward. These guys fell back. I love to tell people that are into that stuff. I said, well, it may be God, but it's a judgment upon you if you keep doing that. So stop it. This whole slain in the spirit is not of God. There is a slain in the spirit that is true, but it's only happened to a few people in this world, and they all radically were changed by the power of God. They drew back and they fell, fell, fell to the ground. Verse 6, he said to them, I am, again, ego ami. And they said, Jesus of whom, uh, verse 7, again, they asked him, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Na the Nazarene, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says, I told you that I am, ego ami, three times. And therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the word might be fulfilled in which it says, one of, of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. And that's the story of Peter. Um, goes on and tells the story of Peter drawing his sword. But we're giving a lot of details on this. If you seek me, let these go their way. Jesus is literally giving himself away instead of the disciples. And John, when you read the book of John, and, and, and you can seek searches on your own, John has a, 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 the way he writes his gospel is very different than, than, than Mark, Luke, and John. You can spend a whole lifetime on the book of John. It's so fascinating. He has little things about the Antichrist all mixed in throughout the Bible, through, through his gospel. He doesn't talk about the last days like in chapters. He just sprinkles it all through the, through the book of John, right? And his whole, the whole book, it's almost the last week of Jesus. So many details. And he has this thing called, the, the, the scholars call it, a corporate solidarity, where one person represents a large group of people. Maybe you heard Jacob mention that term before. He uses it. It's probably one of the few scholars that I heard him use those terms. That corporate solidarity is somebody, one person represents a great number of people. And John, there's a bunch of them in John. There's uh, Barabbas. There's Pilate. There's all kinds of different people throughout the Gospel of John. That's what's so fascinating. If you read it in detail and take the time, you will find this Gospel is quite different than the other three. 
Uh, and it's representing Jesus as being God, of course. But here's a story of Jesus saying, take me, let these go. Who did the disciples represent? Aren't you a disciple? <laughs> right? Who is Jesus saying, take me and let, let you go? Satan comes for you. The sin of death, right? Law of sin and death wants us because we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus steps in and says, no, take me. Don't take, don't take Marco, let him go. Don't take Ivan, let him go. Don't take Dwight, let him go. Don't take Dana, let, him, let her go. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. At that moment, Jesus was taking on the sins of you and I and was giving himself away. Turn to Galatians 2.20. We're done with this. Corinthians says, He who knew no sin, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul knew quite well this story. And in Galatians 2.20, we hear one of the most amazing passages in all the Bible. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Literally saying, when Christ was crucified, I died with him. On that day, I died with him. All of us died with Christ on that day. If you're born again, you crucify the old nature. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's Christianity, by the way, in a nutshell. It's Christ in you, living his life through you. And the life which I now live, the life which I now live, right? Never depend on your past faith. Ah, oh, 20 years ago, I used to walk with the Lord. Where was it at now? Paul says, the life which I now live, I live by faith. Never count on your past faith. Paul never did that. He counted on the faith that he had today. In fact, the faith that you finish is more important than the faith that you start with. I know that shocks a lot of people, but it doesn't matter. It's biblically true. The faith that you finish is more important than the faith that you started. Think about that for a while. Paul says, the life that I now live, I now live. How you live in your life today, is it a crucified life? Is it a life surrendered to Christ? Is it a life that is submitted to the Holy Spirit, that it's Christ living through you? It doesn't matter what happened 20 years ago. Thank God, right? <laughs> Thank God for some of us. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what happened 20 years, 10 years, 5 years ago. It doesn't matter. The life which I now live. How is that life today? I live in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Wow. That is the garden right there. Jesus stepped in, and when sin and death came knocking at your door to take us to hell, when the devil wanted us to, for himself, he stepped in and said, let these go. Take me. And on he went. And the life that you now live, because he did that, you can live by faith. Because he delivered himself up for, for us, that we may have the righteousness of God in us. Hallelujah. What a blow. You guys are not listening. The righteousness of God in you. How righteous is God? All righteous? That's what he's given you. That's what he gave you when he gave himself up for you. Let it shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. <laughs> Remember that song that our, our kids sing? Let this light of Christ shine through you. We were there in the garden. And I'll leave you with this song. I want to sing this song one day. Sergio's not here. He had to go home because he's sick. But Aristide's here. Uh, I want to sing this song. I'm not going to sing it, by the way, but I'll tell you what it is. It's an old uh, black hymn. It's a Negro spiritual, they called it. And it's called, Were You There? And, 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 and the black brothers in the early 1900s knew this song, and it's called, Were You There? Where they, when they crucified my Lord. It was a beautiful song. And the crowd would stand up in, in, the, in the black churches. It was right on churches. And they would say, yes, we were all there. Were you there where they crucified my Lord? So I'm going to say that part. 
and you're going to say, yes, we were all there. Where are you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, we were all there. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that every blessing and goodness has been given to us through his death and resurrection. Lord, we deserve none of it. Lord, if it wasn't for you, we would have been taken by the, by the enemy, by the devil. We would have been swallowed up in, in defeat and in death. The Lord, one day, when you come back at the resurrection, at the rapture and the resurrection, we will be able to sing, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? It is gone. It is destroyed. The sin of death, the sin and the power of death has been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that through you, you giving yourself away became our Redeemer, became our Lord, became the second Adam. And Adam, all have sinned. Lord, we were all born under Adam, but now we're born again under Jesus. And in him, we have newness of life and the promise of the resurrection. Lord, what an amazing passage this is. Help us not to overlook it. Help us not to think about it in such a way that I've read it before and I don't know what it is and, and I'm so accustomed to it. Lord, give us a fresh look to it. Give us a new application of it and give us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to live it out that will take on flesh and live out this message, Lord, in such a way that we would draw people to you, Lord, that we would bring people to the cross. Lord, we're heading there. We're heading to the cross. We're heading where our sins were nailed and, and, and our past life was crucified. Lord, help us to have that strength and faith to live for you today. Not what happened tomorrow, Lord, but what we do today and what we do tomorrow. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. The free gift of God in Christ Jesus is eternal life. And we ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Where are you there when they crucify my Lord? I love to do that song. <laughs>